meteorologist are at a loss to explain what is causing this weather and why it has taken them by surprise. That sudden drop in temperature has half an hour ago. Mexican officials closed the border in the line of so many U.S. refugees. We prepare to go live to Los Angeles. What you see is happening now. Look over there behind me. That's a, a tornado. Yes, a twister. In this is just massive. The video disturbing. An unarmed man fatally shot after three police officers confronted his friends on the report of a stolen bicycle. Did they have a weapon or anything? Um, I don't think so. No? Okay. Ricardo Diaz Zeferino was shot eight times after he was repeatedly told by the police officers to keep his hands in the air. The powerful system has sparked tornadoes and sent cars and trucks barreling into houses. At least 150 homes have been destroyed. I lost everything that I had, everything, everything, oh, except for my life and my son, and I thank God that I didn't do that. Also here, the hard left and anarchists. And as darkness fell, violence broke out on one corner of the square hard core of protesters through Molotov cocktails at police lines. They registered from 3.2 to 4.6 magnitude. The earthquake started rumbling around 6 o'clock last night. They continued off and on through the night until about 10 o'clock. We turned out to California this evening and video authorities did not want the public to see. Dash cam video showing three unarmed men, their hands in the air, officers with their guns drawn. Police opening fire when one of them lowers his arms. The case is from 2013. The video just coming to light settled for nearly five million dollars. ABC senior justice correspondent Pierre Thomas on how taxpayers are paying these massive settlements. The video disturbing. An unarmed man fatally shot after three police officers confronted his friends over the report of a stolen bicycle. Did they have a weapon or anything? Um, I don't think so. No? Okay. Ricardo Diaz Zeferino was shot eight times after he was repeatedly told by the police officers to keep his hands in the air. But he does not follow police orders, at different points dropping his hands. The third time he did so, taking off his cap and holding his palms out, police started firing. But no weapon was discovered and the city decided to pay $4.7 million to settle a lawsuit. The police in the city of Gardena, California actively fought the video's release. But it was disclosed this week after a federal judge said the public had a right to see the video, even if it was embarrassing to the police. His brother says Zeferino was just trying to help him find his stolen bike. The video's release came just a day after New York City agreed to pay the family of Eric Garner more than $5 million in connection with his choking death. In recent years, cities throughout this country have paid hundreds of millions of dollars to settle lawsuits involving allegations of police misconduct. New York City and Chicago each paying out over $400 million. And Pierre is with us now. Pierre, even though the victim's family has settled in the case, they're now calling for a new investigation? That's right. The family is asking the Justice Department to open a civil rights investigation, and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles is reviewing the case. Thousands of protesters gathered in Syntagma Square. They came to express their anger with the laws being debated inside Parliament. They came from the unions and from all sectors of Greek society. These are the people who voted no to the policies of austerity. Also here, the hard left and anarchists. And as darkness fell, violence broke out on one corner of the square hard core of protesters through Molotov cocktails at police lines. 
This has been by far the largest demonstration in St. Agnes Square in recent days. And in the last few minutes, the anger has boiled over. There have been confrontations between protesters and the police. Stun grenades have been fired. And as you can hear, tear gas canisters are now being fired into the crowd. Tension was rising inside Parliament as well as the deadline for the crucial vote approached. A member of the right-wing Golden Dawn Party lashed out at the latest proposals for new taxes, more VAT and higher retirement ages. And ministers from the governing Syriza party showed just how divided they are. Madame Pneumonia. The country cannot move forward with bailouts. The country is destroyed. Greece has many alternative solutions. There must be political will to implement these alternatives. It is now obvious that the government is bringing an agreement under conditions of unbelievable pressure, under blackmail. But having realised that, at the present moment it had no other choice. It had no other choice to avoid the onset of a new humanitarian crisis. Rebels will vote against the new laws, but the numbers are still in the Prime Minister's favour. Outside, the almost daily ritual of protest by Greeks who thought their government was against austerity. I'm here to protest against the government. It has done nothing different from the previous one. The workers are still bearing the burden of austerity. The Greeks are being told they have no choice but to succumb to the conditions imposed upon them by their creditors. Despite the protests, the quieter majority appears to reluctantly accept this. The government will desperately hope that by doing Brussels bidding, the financial relief of more bailout funds will follow, and the sooner the better. Simon McGregor Wood, Al Jazeera, Athens. It was a day marked by brush fires, one after another, but the worst damaged homes in a Vancouver neighborhood. At 11 o'clock, good evening. I'm Jeff Gianola. And I'm Jennifer Hoff. In all, fires destroyed two houses and damaged another. Our Cole Miller has been following these fires all day. He's live in Vancouver tonight. Cole? Well, Jennifer, Jeff, we're just off of the Columbia tonight, and like you said, that's where these fires were popping up seemingly one after the other. And those two homes you mentioned, well, this is all that's left of them tonight. You can see the damage even in the dark here. Fire crews keeping an eye on things. They'll be here overnight. This is in the Hillcrest neighborhood. Now, before all of this, crews already had their hands full. I saw flames shooting up over this, this house and smoke just pouring this way. From across the Columbia River, flames two stories tall, a brush fire burning its way towards homes. Joe Martin says he was way too close for comfort, his home in the path. It came right up to our deck. And I mean, I'm just thinking, oh my God, is it going to go all the way? His Vancouver home nearly torched. His neighbor, not as lucky. Her house got singed pretty bad. All the vegetation is destroyed. That was at around 5 this evening, but crews were just getting started. As we were mopping that fire up, we were dispatched at about 6.30 to uh, this fire. Two homes just blocks away from that first fire engulfed. Vancouver Fire says its resources were running thin. Portland Fire and Hazeldell pitched in to help out. It's a significant challenge. And neighbors like Beth Biggs say standing by, unable to help, wasn't easy. And then my dad's like, oh my gosh, there's a huge fire. And I looked and I'm like, oh my goodness. She lives just next door. The whole thing is just like scary and it's sad because like a lot of these people are like family to me and like I've known them for so long and it's heartbreaking to see and watch. With such destruction in such a short period of time, it's a reminder that being careful can't be an afterthought. This is an exceptional day. It's, uh, the, it's been a dry couple of weeks, uh, so everything is primed. Uh, when one fire starts, other things are going to happen. And here's another look tonight at these two homes badly damaged, one with a collapsed roof, the other appears totaled. Thankfully, though, no one was hurt here. We're still waiting to find out what sparked them. Now, back at that first fire, a captain there did injure his hand. He had to be taken to the hospital. He's expected to be okay. And just south of here, another small brush fire popped up. Crews say an ember from one of the homes here was behind that.
morning, at least six people are still missing in Kentucky after violent flooding. Two people died from the rushing water. Indiana and Illinois are also dealing with severe weather. Powerful winds and heavy rains destroyed more than 150 homes. Don Daler is in Staffordsville, Kentucky, where a state of emergency is in effect. Don, good morning. Good morning. The rain has stopped for now, but there's still a lot of flooding and high water in this area. And if you take a look at the debris and the trees, you can see just how high the water got at its apex there. It's easily five or six feet above where I am right now. The governor of Kentucky has declared a state of emergency as the search for the missing continues. A violent line of storms pummeling its way through the Midwest has washed away homes and shattered communities here in Kentucky. Oh my God! Days of torrential rainfall have left people here struggling to regroup. Pure devastation, pure destruction. It's bad eating. The flooding has turned deadly. At least six people have been reported missing. Melissa Blankenship has not been able to find her cousin who was helping others when the storm hit. He saved um, his stepsister that fell and she went under the water and he saved her and he got my grandma onto the porch. Definitely a hero. The powerful system has sparked tornadoes and sent cars and trucks barreling into houses. At least 150 homes have been destroyed. I lost everything that I had, everything, everything, oh, except for my life and my son and I thank God that I didn't do that. Brad Salisbury tried to escape to his attic with his three children as the flooding intensified. Everybody pretty much lost everything here. There's nothing left. I mean, which I'll never be coming back here. I got three kids and I don't want to put them through this no more. I just, it's rough. Torrential rains last night forced authorities to call off the search, but now that the skies are cleared, they're hope to start them again this morning. Don Daler in Staffordsville, Kentucky, thanks.
You're looking at the last visible satellite images of Typhoon Nanka as it was approaching the east coast of Japan. And you know, they've just been getting hammered overnight. Of course, people were getting ready throughout the day, but uh, since the storm has hit, more than two dozen people have been injured in over 13 prefectures, and that's according to the NHK. Now, uh, this is a fairly large storm. It's affecting a really big region and some pretty big cities as well. I mean, Kobe, we're talking about Osaka, places like that. And you know, as we kind of zoom in here, you can see it's mainly southern Japan, luckily north of Okinawa who got hit by Chanholm uh, last week, but you can see Okayama, Kobe, Kyoto, uh, these are pretty good sized cities, a little bit south of Tokyo, a lot of rain, I think rain's going to be the number one problem with this storm, but the wind does tend to calm down as we go on in time. An intense and largely stationary thunderstorm created flash floods in part of the New York City borough of Brooklyn Wednesday. In places, the water was about a foot deep. It happened in a narrow area of western Brooklyn across from Manhattan. The borough was hit hard because the storm didn't move as it dumped two to three inches of rain in the area. Cars and bicyclists had trouble getting through as streets turned into shallow rivers and traffic snarled. The storm system also created flight delays. More than 150 flights were canceled at LaGuardia, JFK, and Newark airports. I'm Matt Sampson, The Weather Channel. Southern Oregon last night, there were six of them. They were between magnitude 3.2 and 4.6. They're in the remote Lakeview area that's near the border with Nevada and California. No damage or injuries were reported. That's good news, but we wanted to know now if those quakes could signal an even bigger quake closer to home. We sent our core Harlan to get the facts. This is the earthquake house at Omsi. The shaking of this house is meant to simulate the 5.6 magnitude quake that struck the Scotts Mills area in Western Oregon back in 1993. The largest in a year-long swarm of quakes in northern Nevada near the Oregon border struck Wednesday evening at about 6.52. At 4.6 magnitude, it's the largest of nearly 4,600 quakes that have shaken this same unpopulated area of northern Nevada in the last year. And it's not the first time swarms of quakes have happened in what geologists are now calling the Bald Mountain Earthquake Swarm Area. Sometimes they build up to a six and a half, and sometimes they go on for a year and then just go back to sleep. And we really don't have a, a solid understanding of why they're happening. I wanted to know from Ian Maiden, who is now the interim Oregon State Geologist, should these Nevada quakes give Oregon and Washington earthquake watchers anything to be concerned about? But does this mean anything in a, in a bigger scheme of things in the region? No, this is really a pretty isolated system. Maiden tells me the bald mountain quakes southeast of Lakeview are different in geological terms than a recent swarm of quakes off the southern Oregon coast, but the two swarms are alike in that they are not related to the big quake. Recently, U.S. Geological Survey seismologist Seth Moran told me the big Cascadia subduction zone quake would come from a fault line running very close to the coastline. It's caused mega quakes and tsunamis in the past, and it remains in an eerie sort of silence because geologists think it's stuck. The area where it's stuck is roughly like this, mm -hmm. between my two fingers. Mm -hmm. And if that entire patch were to go all at once, that's a magnitude 9. It's a long fault, it's a wide fault.
Many South Koreans are worried for their safety. They saw the ferry Sewol go down in April. They've seen bus and train crashes and other accidents. And many are worried about another safety problem. More than 500 sinkholes have opened in Seoul since the start of the year. More from NHK World's Anna Zhang. People were shocked when this sinkhole opened up last month in a major highway in the Songpa district near downtown Seoul. The Songpa area in Seoul is reported to have the largest number of sinkholes in the city. More than 60 sinkholes have been found this year alone. City officials who investigated the accident found six cavities under the highway. The larger ones were over 80 meters long. The survey concluded the cavities were the result of mistakes in construction when a subway was built nearby. Songpa has a population of 700,000 and is the most densely populated part of Seoul. I'm really worried. It's like the ground could open up at any time. People of Songpa called an emergency public hearing last week. Engineering experts and city officials attended. Anxious residents said they were worried about more sinkholes appearing. They asked how to prevent them. The experts suggested the problem was mostly man-made. We think 80 to 90 percent of sinkholes in South Korea are caused by leaks from broken sewage pipes, which flow into the soil and wash it away. The hearing failed to reassure many about what the authorities are doing to prevent future accidents. Residents are now taking it on themselves to raise the alarm over potential trouble spots. When they find an area that looks dangerous, the residents push the city to make a detailed investigation. This is our home. We've started a movement to put our safety first and foremost. Sinkholes are peering across South Korea one after another. Lee Su-gon, a professor at University of Seoul, says what makes the problem worse is that South Korea as a whole does not take public safety seriously. He says when a sinkhole appears, Authorities prefer to repair it quickly rather than investigate what caused it. We tend to prioritize speedy progress. This has given us an advanced society, but it's also had negative consequences. Progress is important, but it's also important to take time to reflect. The problem of sinkholes continues as officials respond with little more than stopgap measures. Against the backdrop of major accidents, including the Sewol Ferry disaster, pressure is mounting for those in power to take responsibility for ordinary people's safety. Anna Jong, NHK World, Seoul. A video released by an anti-abortion group is sparking anger among conservatives. The highly edited video shows a Planned Parenthood executive talking to actors posing as employees of a human biologics company. The executive's casual discussion of the graphic details of abortion has many people shocked. And Planned Parenthood says that it has done nothing wrong, but Republicans on Capitol Hill are demanding an investigation. An abortion provider discussed how to collect body parts from aborted fetuses over lunch at a California restaurant. The secret recording made by anti-abortion activists. Every provider has had patients who want to donate their tissue and they absolutely want to accommodate them. 
The Center for Medical Progress posted the video, which it says was shot last year, and proves Planned Parenthood illegally sells fetal organs and tissues. CMP points to this online form to order tissue by organ and age of the fetus. And this exchange between two actors posing as representatives of a biologics company and Planned Parenthood's director of medical services. I would say it's probably anywhere from 30 to $100, depending on the facility and what's involved. The 30 to $100 price, or that's per yes. specimen that we're talking per about, specimen. right? Yeah. Yes. Planned Parenthood calls the group's claims flat out untrue. And those dollar amounts? The organization says that was about the cost to transport donated tissue. Standard practice. Medical ethicists say exchanges like this suggest doctors adjust their procedures to ensure the desired tissues are collected. I'd say a lot, a lot of people want liver. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, most providers will do this case after ultrasound guidance. So they'll know where they're putting their forceps. The video is prompting a backlash from Republican House Speaker John Boehner and others. Congress must and it will investigate, and I believe we will put an end to these horrific practices. Deadly encounter between Las Vegas police and an armed driver captured on an officer's body camera. Take a look at this. Step out of the car, sir. No. Sir, I'm not going to ask you again. Step out of the car. I'm going to shoot myself. Do you have a gun? Yes, yeah, stop, stop. Stop. No, no. 413, 413. He's got a gun. He's got a gun. A 54-year-old was shot and killed by police after opening fire and wounding a rookie officer. Dodora was pulled over for just a taillight infraction. Police say he threatened his wife days earlier and she had a protective order against him. The officer is recovering. He's supposed to be okay. You know, body cameras are a big issue right now. Some in the law enforcement community are for them, some are against them, but it's always a window into what this job entails. Absolutely, and we talk about it all the time. There's no such thing as a routine traffic stop for police, and you see it there, a taillight infraction. We've seen people pulled over for that, and it can so quickly escalate and turn and deadly. And you hear in the officer's voice, they're trained, they're different than the rest of us, yeah. but in those moments of panic, their fears are the same. This guy's going for a gun, right. I'm gonna get shot, right. and someone does get shot. Yeah. A senior defense official has just told us that they now can confirm indeed that the four personnel killed were indeed United States Marines. The Pentagon saying very quietly that yes, they were, there were four Marines that were killed in this incident. Their families, of course, at this hour now being notified. So this is automatically a very sensitive situation, mm. as you can imagine, for the U.S. military. We talked a few minutes ago about how the Pentagon would know very quickly if any of its personnel were killed. Uh, mm -hmm. It apparently took some time for this word to filter through the system, uh, through the Marine Corps, through the military services, and come to the Pentagon. The information we are being given is that the four Marines were killed at the second shooting site, not at the strip mall site, but the shooter apparently then drove to another site, a support facility, fired there, and, and the mm -hmm. indications the Pentagon has is that this is where the Marines were killed. Um, in addition, and I think it was addressed in the press conference, the military going now through all of its databases with the identity of the shooter, which we do not know, to see if this person uh, potentially uh, had any prior military service. But this incident began just shortly before at 11 o'clock this morning, East Coast time, when this still unidentified male drove up to this uh, strip mall recruiting station, opened fire through the door. Uh, we see that, that door full of bullet holes. Um, was, there was a military person injured there and then drove on to this other site a short distance away. And apparently, by all accounts now, according to the Pentagon, four Marines killed there. Um, at the moment, uh, the Pentagon not really able to answer whether they're treating this as an incident of terrorism. Uh, certainly law enforcement, domestic law enforcement, taking uh, the major lead role in this. But they are looking to see, could the shooter have had prior military service? 
Is there anything they might know about this person that would help them understand and explain what happened here?